Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, for the last time on stage. Thank you for, oh, I have some sides already. Yeah, I thought that would be exuberant, actually, exuberance coming from it. Not quite to the Harry Potter magic yet, but uh, we have our own sort of potions of, of magic here on stage to uh, get you through the last session. Um, thanks again to everyone for, for your participation today, for, for joining us. And uh, like I said, it's not over yet. We've got a lot to look forward to. Um, a couple of reminders, just uh, after this session, uh, buses are going to leave to Warner Brothers at 6 o'clock, or around 6 o'clock, so you'll have a little bit of time to drop things off at your room, but then be ready to, to uh, if you're taking a coach with us, we'll, we'll drive you over. If you're driving uh, on your own, um, I think we can get, we have the directions on the reg desk if you, if you need them. Um, we mentioned, Louis mentioned at the end of last session that we're going to be doing some live voting uh, this, uh, this session. We, we do that via the, the live program, as we said, the live app. Uh, as we mentioned, you, you can log on to that following the link, which is up there. It's also, uh, well, yeah, it's, it's bit.ly uh, bit slash ALUK live. You use your email address, and the delegate number, if you were wondering, is printed on your badge, so it's, it's on your badge. You would have also received an email from us uh, this morning with a link, direct link to this and, and that, that information. If you can, whilst we're kind of going through a few other things, uh, take some time and log on because, you know, we've got a pretty good sample of people here uh, of different parts of the UK supply chain. So we'd like to get as much of your feedback for these questions as possible. And we also have participants outside the room watching the live, which who will be able to participate in this as well. So do. Uh, do vote on that. Oh, sorry, do, uh, do, do take a minute to, to log in. We're also going to do a traditional prize draw in a moment. You would have given in your business cards uh, when, you, when you registered, so we're going to pull one out of a bowl and, and give that away. I have to admit, when we do this conference in other parts of the world, we, we tell, I'm not sure, a little story, a little fib maybe, that we, we we're giving them the Queen's favorite biscuits. Um, the Americans really love that. Um, they're really excited about it. I'm not sure we can quite get away with that in this, in this audience, really, because I actually have no idea if the queen eats these biscuits, <laughs> biscuits at all. So I guess the inverse would be, you know, if you take the leader of the other world, according to Donald, tr Donald Trump, these are some bad, bad cookies. Okay? <laughs> Believe me, really bad. So we're going we're gonna to give away some, some actually lovely biscuits, uh, if I can ask my, uh, my, my, my wonderful colleague, Belle, to come to the stage. Belle is, by the way, the genius behind the organization, so everything that has gone so well is thanks to Belle and her team. And I'm, I'm pleased to, to announce the winner of these bad cookies is Oliver Chandler from Satra Technology. Is Oliver in the room? No. If Oliver's not in the room, we'll do it again, <laughs> because you've got to be in it to win it, as you say. But my son wins them. <laughs> so one more time. Uh, is Jason Lee from Cherry Jaguar Land Rover, or one of his colleagues, perhaps, from JLR in the room who could, who could pass that over? Yes. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> yeah. So, can you share? Yeah, wonderful. Share it amongst the JLR team, please. <laughs> Okay, so again, um, maybe before I move on to the voting, just because to, to remind you the point of this session, after we do our voting, we're going to have, a, we have a, a lovely panel here of, of experts uh, to kind of close out our session, some senior leaders from, from some key uh, companies here, car, car makers here in the UK. Uh, I just want to introduce them so, so that, you know, as we all sit here, uh, we're pleased to, to welcome Bob Mountain, who's the head of Finnish Vehicle Logistics and Supply Chain and Logistics uh, at Honda Europe. We're also pleased to, uh, to welcome Awais Ajimal, General Manager of Supply Chain and Business Processes for Kia Motors UK. Very pleased to, to also have joined Juan Manuel Santiago Mendez, who's the Managing Director of Mercedes-Benz Parts Logistics UK, and some bloke at the end there. Um, at the end. <laughs> uh, so we, we, we have a mix here of, uh, well, they're in, in import brands, uh, although there's also local manufacturing represented, and uh, so we have a chance to cover different aspects of the supply chain. And I do hope you'll, you'll get involved. We, we do want a, uh, an audience dialogue here, uh, questions going back and forth, participation. 
and perhaps I'm out of line, but I have a, a special request that maybe we have some questions or comments from some of the, the, the very intelligent and, and you know, representation of the women in logistics that we have here at the conference as well, because we have not heard that much today on stage or from the audience. So that's just a personal request and challenge uh, to the audience um, to not let me down on that one. So, um, but that's gonna come at the end of, of the voting. And um, we kind of hope that this, this, this voting will kind of give us uh, a cup, some food for thought um, going into our discussion. Some of the questions come from our sponsors, who we asked to, to submit these questions in advance. Uh, others come from, from our AL team. And you'll, you'll recognize many of them are covering the sorts of topics and, 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 and issues that we've been talking about throughout the day. And we just want to get, you know, get your anonymous but truthful uh, opinions about them. So hopefully you've had time to log on. If you have, then what you'll be doing, what you'll be looking at, is um, our live um, program here. And and if you're looking at an iPhone, there or <laughs> needn't be an iPhone. If you're looking at a mobile phone, there's a, a tab uh, for voting. Uh, so you just go to that tab, and the votes will appear. If you're on uh, an iPad or or, um, or a laptop, it'll just be below the the live feed of of the um, <clears throat> of the video for the benefit of our live audience, so to speak. Um, there's a bit of a delay between the video and the vote, so look at the voting questions as opposed to listening to my voice on that. And, um, and then hopefully we'll be, we'll be good to go, and we can bring up our first question. First question comes from Kuna and Nagel, and the question is, have you considered or enacted any changes to your supply chain to accommodate the transport of lithium batteries? Uh, so, is it something you haven't considered at all? Somewhat. You're actively planning. It's fully planned, uh, or it's already implemented. So where are you, or your customer, however you may be involved in, on this? Um, where, where, do you, where do you see that currently? So it's 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 forty five percent somewhat. So that's that's much better than than, we, than it could have been with not at all. And another thirty percent are quite actively planning. None of you have implemented it, uh, so none is fully planned. So we're still in the transition phase, which kind of makes sense because although there's a lot going on in the EV space, um, I think we saw the figure this morning. There's hundred and ten thousand or so on the road in the UK today. Uh, obviously, there's leaf production up in up in up in Sunderland. Um, but there, there is uh, still a long way to go towards really getting our head around on, the, on that uh, supply chain. Next question. This is from Priority Freight. With the complex challenges ahead to meet electric vehicle production demands, do we envisage an increase in inventory and stockpiling to reduce risk within the supply chain? So do you see some increases in inventory and stock as we plan for, for electric vehicle production? Simple yes or no answer on this one, please. That's a familiar vote split, actually, I remember from 52% um, yes. no, 48% yeah, yes. So it's kind of evenly split here. Um, but since none of you have implemented anything yet or really planned it, I think we can all just still call this a best guess about what's actually going to happen when, uh, when, when, when that production increases. <clears throat> Next question. This is from ABP. Uh, so when you think about connectivity in 2018, what is key to you? So this is a little bit more immediate in terms of what you're planning for your supply chain in 2018. Do you think most about storage capacity and connectivity? Are you thinking about road connectivity? Are you thinking about rail connectivity? Are you thinking about shipping network and connectivity? Or is it actually connectivity to the end, to the end user and final customer? Still just okay. Pretty big, sh major well, not majority, but a, a, the largest share actually talking about sort of 
storage capacity. No, actually, it's switched again. I'm reading that totally wrong. Access to end user, that's actually encouraging. So, so we see the, the biggest opportunity in, in connecting to the final customer, maybe making the supply chain more customer-centric. That's a good indication of where, of where things are heading in automotive logistics. Okay, next question from our sponsor, Jeffco. There have been many discussions about change in the automotive industry, not least today uh, across our conference. Which area currently has the highest priority for change for you and your company? Is it Brexit? Is it electric vehicles? Is it autonomous vehicles? Or is it supply chain change in general? So most of you are looking at supply chain change coming in at almost 40%. Brexit, uh, on, on a big issue for about a third of you, at least in terms of the top priority. Um, but obviously, those are all, all kind of uh, key issues for most peop many people in this room or in this audience. OK, this is some, some more broad questions from our team. This is looking a little bit about your outlook uh, for the UK. So in terms of your plans for your business, if you're a logistics provider or your logistics operation and budget, if you're a manufacturer, um, as relates in the UK, for the UK for 2018, are you looking at increase growth in double digit, for example, increases next year? Uh, are you looking at a, a, an increase, but somewhat smaller? Are you looking at sort of stable levels to, to now? Uh, are you looking at a, maybe a mild decrease or a substantial decrease? So your, basically your outlook for your business in the supply chain in the UK next year. <laughs> so reasonably positive, actually 43% with a somewhat increase, with 27% substantial, that's a, a, a big majority seeing an increase uh, for next year. Um, and, and very few of you uh, are looking at decreases. So despite the market being in a little bit of decline this year, you're seeing that recover next year, um, and you're pretty optimistic. <coughs> okay, next question. This is, we have two questions coming up on Brexit now. The UK's plan to departure from the EU has thus far, so far, had what impact on your business and automotive supply chain? Has the Im impact up to now been very positive? Has the impact been somewhat positive? Has it hadn't really had an impact as yet? Somewhat negative impact or a very negative impact? This is up to now. What's the impact of Brexit vote? So maybe not a surprise, 65% of it, no impact, 18% uh, somewhat negative impact. Perhaps those are the brands that are importing vehicles into the market right now, for example. Um, some with 9%, maybe those are the exporters, I don't know. Um, and then obviously a few with some, some more other views there. But basically, obviously, we're still in a wait and see. So the next question is asking you to look out a little bit. So when Brexit actually happens apparently, supposedly in March 2019, if we assume that's the case, what do you think the impact will be after that for your business uh, and automotive supply chain? Again, very positive, somewhat positive, no notable impact, somewhat negative, very negative. There's a Pretty clear majority there. Actually, it's overwhelmingly negative if you add that together. So somewhat 58%, 21% say very negative, 10% of you, or roughly 11% of you, are very positive, and then, and then the rest. So, so although we're not really seeing an impact for the people in this, in this room, uh, your outlook is pretty negative on, on Brexit. So what's, uh, we've talked a lot about the future, and, and I think that's, that's right. That's the point of many of these conferences to come together. But what about your main challenge in the UK today, 2017, and maybe into next year as well? Is it a lack of capacity, lack of assets and, and, and transport warehouses, space, et cetera? Is it the complexity of your supply chain, whether it's the long distance international flows that are, that are challenging you? Is it visibility? 
in connectivity in the supply chain? <coughs> is it a forecasting and planning issue? That's, that's your biggest challenge. Or is it just a general economic and political uncertainty? So what's your biggest headache right now? Forty-one percent inaccurate forecasting and, and planning, followed by the visibility and connectivity. So, it's a familiar issue. We've heard it before, and I think what was the quote earlier about the forecast is either lucky or, or wrong. So, this is uh, clearly an issue. But I guess the hope is that with <coughs> predictive analytics and the potential to to move forward on that, we we could improve that. Although, good luck. <laughs> So what about the strengths of uh, the UK automotive logistics network right now? Would you say the strongest aspect for your company in the UK is the road and, and motorway network? Is it the rail and multimodal intermodal network? Is it the port and shipping network? Or is it the airport and air connection? So on a transport and logistics focus, what is the, what's, which, which part of the network is strongest for your company in your view? So it's a pretty tight race between the ports and the road. Um, I guess for an island nation, you kind of hope that the ports uh, are gonna be strong there, um, but then the road seen as relatively strong. Nobody, nobody in this audience is particularly strengthening the rail side of things, so that tells us something. Uh, in, by the time we retire and HS2 comes online, maybe we'll have a different, a different view about that. So in terms of IT and technological implementation, if we compare your operations in the UK with the rest of Europe, would you say that in the UK it's a bit further advanced uh, in terms of IT, at a similar level, behind, or you, you can't compare because you don't have the operations to compare? So half of the room think it's actually behind, and 18% uh, is similar level, but, but clearly half of the people um, would like to see some improvements on that side, and uh, so we, we've heard a few comments about that today. But not, not terribly positive news going into the connected age and uh, Industry 4.0. Right, so let's talk about your outlook again, forward looking. In, the, in 10 years time, the share of new vehicles bought in the UK that will be battery, electric, or alternative propulsion, so that, that's a fuel cell as well, so any kind of alternative propulsion vehicle, what do you think the share of new vehicle market in the UK will be in, in 10 years' time? Up to 10%, uh, 11 to 20%, 21 to 30%, 31 to 40%, or, or greater than 40%. This is the share of new cars at the time that will be uh, alternative propulsion. So that's pretty pretty high share. Uh, mm -hmm. It's dead dead heat between. So about 60% of you basically think it's going to be above 20 20%. 20 A fair fair share of you think it's going to be greater than than 40%. So either way, um, considering I think the share today is what not 0.2% or something like that, um, that's pretty tremendous growth over the next 10 years, according to the, according to this audience. And then looking at it from a different kind of point of view, if we talk about in 10 years' time, what share of vehicles are going to be impacted by e-commerce? So that could be either purchased online, maybe shared fleet services, uh, or in some way connected on, online, um, uh, whether, again, this is a shared, shared pool. Um, where do you see that going over the next 10 years? Do you see that as being the same proportions, 1 to 10%, 11 to 20%, 21 to 30%, 31 to 40%, or greater than 40%? Interesting. 
Again, a pretty big share. 35% of you think uh, up to 20% of the vehicles um, will, will come down to a software platform in some, some way. Perhaps that's ordering the car via, via uh, the internet. Perhaps that's going to be not even owning the car, sharing it. Um, so a, big, a pretty big change is along the way according to your expectations. I think that was our last uh, question, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so, so thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I think it's always, we just, we like taking the pulse of the room. It gives us a little bit of, of food for thought there. Um, it lets us take uh, a bit of a, of a group, group perspective on some of the topics we talked about today. Uh, according to you, things are, things are a little bit negative on, on the Brexit front, quite positive in the short term for the market. And uh, we got a lot of work to do uh, for connectivity, for technology, and to really make the supply chain sort of come alive. Because this disruption, which you're also anticipating, uh, perhaps as much as a third of the vehicles being uh, electronic or alternative propulsion, and a, a lot of them coming online. So, so again, a lot of interesting results there. Um, that now leaves us with plenty of time to sort of get into the meat of, uh, of the discussion, right, to take some of those findings and put into our panel. Um, and, and I get some dialogue and feedback from, from you as well. Again, the, pan the, the, the name of this conference was uh, Next Stop Change, right? Mind the gaps. And we've been trying to pin down what those gaps are throughout the day, where, um, where the gaps are in the supply chain, which we're trying to uh, address. So um, I, I want to hand over to a panel. Now, what I actually want to do is go back to the question which was in there about the kind of top challenge for, for now. Because although we are looking ahead and being forward looking, we all have day jobs and we, we need to kind of you know, take care of the, of the present uh, as well as looking to the future, which is we know a great challenge. So I thought maybe we can, we can start, yeah, we well, can see the result, thank you, we can see what the results were here. No, that was uh, the budgets, but uh, the, we can in a moment move it to the question related to the challenges today. But to, to our panel, what, what, what's your current challenge. So Bob, if we can start from Honda's point of view, what's sort of keeping, keeping you awake at night, which is what is making, making life more difficult for Honda and your logistics today before we start talking about the future? Uh, sure. I think, um, and I think if we look at the uh, short term, I think uh, visibility is, is always the, uh, the issue that's, that's causing us to scratch our heads. Um, we all like perfect visibility down the supply chain. I think probably none of us have got it. We certainly haven't. And uh, uh, it's really a question of how to fill the gaps. Now, if you like my company, I'm sure you've got some state-of-the-art systems and processes, uh, but I'm sure you've got legacy systems that you, you wish you'd been able to scrap uh, 10 years ago, which are compromising your ability to, to see down the supply chain. And that's certainly our situation. So I think that, that would be something that we would be looking to, uh, to, to change and improve on an ongoing basis. But you have to recognise that as soon as you, you get to the next step, then the next step is already there. Mm. Uh, I think we're looking further ahead. I think um, some of the things that were touched on today at the conference is um, maybe a lack of strategic thinking uh, in, in automotive logistics. I think that was some, certainly something that I would highlight. We've just come off the back of a nine-month logis European logistics tender. Uh, we've been talking to, I don't know, maybe 150 mm. European suppliers. Uh, and I would say you could probably count on the fingers of one hand the suppliers where you really think they have got a clear view of where their organization is going to be in 10 or 15 years' time. Mm. Uh, we did this exercise internally last year, uh, and it really it was really quite enlightening because uh, it, it showed the scale of things that we don't know. We can't predict. We've talked today about the pace of change and how it's, uh, it's increasing. Uh, and we don't know wh where we're going to be in 10 years' time. So the things that we can focus on are agility uh, is one key thing, uh, and technology. We need to close any gaps that we've got in terms of technology. Uh, and those are the two of the things that we've taken out of that process. But what I would really like to see from some of our supply partners is a much stronger focus on where you think you are going to be and how we can work together to, to actually to reach some common uh, understanding of the future. Thank you. Hi. So in terms of challenges, I, I think that's a, it's an interesting question because obviously the changing um, social environment, and, and we're, which we've seen over the past 
year or so, which is the, the, this rapid change of customer perception that diesels are bad and uh, petrol is good, which <laughs> is very, very different to what it was uh, a few years ago, has actually <coughs> certainly challenged us and our, our supply chain and our factories um, in, ter in terms of making that switch very quickly, and obviously that leads to other stocking issues. Um, you know, in terms of ha having a stock imbalance with too many diesel cars and too few petrol cars to actually satisfy demand. Um, so that, that's certainly a challenge. Um, the, the other challenges are the, the you know other things which are happening within the macroeconomic environment in terms of Brexit. You know, what does that mean for us? What does that mean for our suppliers? And how quickly can we react to uh, changing uh, market conditions? Um, and I think certainly for us, and I think it's been spoken quite a lot uh, in the conference today, is about customers and changing customer demand and patterns. Um, you know, we're now in the now generation. You know, I want to order it and I want to get the vehicle <coughs> or as, as immediately as possible. Customers are more challenging, uh, that they're much more knowledgeable on the products um, and they demand customer service. So, uh, and that pressure is passed on to us and we pass it on to our supply chain because they have to react, you know, equivalently like what we want to react as well. So. Thank you. Um, so um, my colleague said many things regarding challenges. For me, uh, the biggest challenge that we have to cope with in the next years is to change a mindset. Okay, I think we are not ready as big, big corporations building cars for 100 years or 80 years or 130 years <laughs> in case of Daimler, Mercedes. Um, we still don't have this global mindset. Okay? We, 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 don't, we don't know well what is going on outside. Um, the company started three years back, a big program. Uh, we recognize that we have to change. Um, and we don't have to change in the paper. We really have to change. We are a very, very big company. And today, someone you know, in a computer is creating an, an app. And this app costs 20 billion in two years changing the world, um, and we have many examples, Airbnb, for example, Uber, clearly. Um, so we recognize we have to change, and we are not only focusing in technologies or uh, uh, how to develop new products, we are focusing how to prepare the management to change, you know, because we notice that a good portion of our management is not able to change, uh, whatever is the reason. So. Um, uh, Good example is we are moving people much more internationally. We are moving people within divisions in two, three years, four years. Uh, the idea is to keep the managers no more than four, five, four or five years in the same position. So for us, it's also um, the, the mindset thing, the, the, the change of the behavior of the managers is quite important. Thank you. Louis, you want to follow up? Yeah, um, I liked earlier the comment that the, the supply chain should be like an orchestra. Um, we've talked a lot about, you know, end-to-end -end supply chains or over the year we've talked about end-to-end -end supply chain management, uh, network management and so on. So if the uh, logistics network is an orchestra, who should be the conductor? Should it be the vehicle maker? Should it be the tier of the supplier? Or should it be the LSP? <laughs> Bob? Of course, the OEM, yeah, of course. Uh. <laughs> Uh, but I think the I think the interesting one of the the possible scenarios of the future where uh, we're talking about we we said in the survey that uh, mm -hmm. you know, twenty percent of cars will be sold out of a, uh, a, a conglomerator or, or um, comparison site. Uh, now that does change the power balance, doesn't it? So it takes the the power away from the the OEM and moves it down into the, the supply chain. So I think uh, it depends a little bit on how quickly that change happens. Mm. Uh, but of course, I would say from an OEM point of view, the OEM. Yeah, but isn't this, I mean, when I've asked OEMs, quite a few of them actually said it should be the LSP. So is isn't necessarily uh, the OEM. So again, back to advice and to Juan. But from my perspective, and you may not agree with me, but I think I don't. it should be the customer. 
Mm. Ultimately, they're the person, uh, they're the individual, the company, the organisation which is purchasing the product or service. So surely they they the, should be they should be the conductor, and they should drive all other events along the supply chain. It should be about value. Uh, everything uh, everything that we do as an industry should be adding value to the customer because if if it's not meeting a regulatory uh, requirement or adding val real value, then what's the point of doing it? You know, there's no point in investing in technology. There's no, if it's not adding value to that end customer, that has to be the key focus. So in my view, it is the customer and yeah. our focus has to be on that, satisfying their needs. Mm -hmm. yeah, I agree, the customer has to tell us how to move forward in, in supply chain and logistics in the future, but I would say, we cannot give everything to service provider. Uh, it's, it's a big mistake, in my opinion. We have to do some things as OEM. And for me, one big example is inventory management. Um, I think inventory management has to be with us, personal opinion, with the OEMs. Of course, warehouse operations could be, let's say, outsourced. It depends on the place, quite clear. Asia, I would say, could be easy sometimes. <coughs> Middle East could be easy. Europe is not so easy because we have also limitations in Europe. Um, but we cannot give everything. I mean, as a company, as a car ma uh, maker, to give everything to a three-party uh, logistic three service, pro uh, service provider is not the right thing. We, we cannot lose that, that ex expertise. And uh, at least we are not doing that. Uh, of course, for me, it's a matrix, and the matrix is customers, different customers in different countries. The customer in China is not the customer in Europe. The customer in Middle East is not the customer in, in Brazil. And different uh, uh, section, inventory management, uh, uh, warehouse operations, uh, um, let's say transportation. So the matrix has to be built, it depends on the place, mm -hmm. but it's not black and white, obviously. We cannot give everything and we cannot do everything. Mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, obviously, you know, there's interesting debates that we can have all day about what you outsource and what you don't and on the different sides of the supply chain, um, whether we're talking implant logistics or spare parts warehouse or yard management and such. But, but I think Bob's point earlier about sort of lack of strategic thinking mm. is something I wanted to sort of pick up on a little bit because, um, I mean, to develop your providers and, and in this connected age, um, was it the IT presentation talking about picking up early signals in the supply chain using all of your all of the resources that are available and kind of maybe bringing a more strategic focus to your providers as well, um, which requires trust and also requires opening, requires systems that can communicate back and forth, people that communicate back and forth. So do you, do you see scope to kind of break down some of these barriers maybe that, um, and, 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 and encourage your providers then to become more strategic? Because if you sort of, if you just tell them what to do, that's probably what they'll do. But if you, if you open it up a little bit more and give them a strategic role, then maybe they'll respond to it. Uh, you'd like to think so. Yeah, I think, I think that is true. Um, I think what's important, and we've touched on it through a number of the speakers today, is to think what are, what are our customers, not only now, but what are they going to be like in 10, 15 years' time? And if we look at the, the millennials, you know, my, my kids are teenagers and, and uh, young 20s now, uh, their way of thinking about the, the car purchase process is completely different to my generation. And you think 97% of people will do um, uh, internet check before they, they even think about what the purchase is going to be. 79% um, of millennials will no longer require to, to do a test drive. And uh, John, I think, uh, referred to YouTube, or the, the independent test drives that people can, can see now. Mm -hmm. uh, and the shocking one for me, 65% of millennials would not expect to haggle the price of the car. <laughs> and maybe you think about the mobile phone generation, you don't haggle with your service provider, you just change service provider, you, you, you migrate. So the, the role of comparison websites and, uh, and uh, conglomerates uh, uh, is going to be significantly increased. Uh, and we've seen the, the impact of that. So 2005, there was an uh, average of five visits to dealerships before a person would buy a car. Now that's 1.6, and that's only just over 10 years. That's an incredible pace of change. Uh, and we as, uh, as OEMs are trying to second guess where that's going. And, and we're, we're trying to work in uh, omni-channel and, and uh, maybe Kira uh, very strong in that area. It'd be worth, worth hearing uh, your opinion later. But uh, 
I, I think we can see those strategic drivers, uh, and I think we can all see them. I, I don't think this is anything that's secret. But what I don't see is, uh, in, in many cases, uh, a proactive uh, willingness to look at what that means from a logistics point of view. Mm. So, for example, if we've got PDI centers now with option mounting, if we've got an omni-channel environment and we're selling directly to the end user, uh, what about PDI? Currently, uh, we have a drive test in, in PDI. So, where is that done? How is that done? Uh, and final mile delivery, is are you going to get a, an eight car transporter pitching up outside a street in Croydon? Uh, is your car, you know, checking the keys? I don't think so. So we, we have to work those things out together and, and I think that's what we, we need to look at as an industry. Definitely agree with Bob there. I, I think there is a change within uh, customers and, uh, and us as an industry aren't, you know, we, we haven't got the, uh, the logistics capability or the strategy just at the moment to actually say, yes, this is how we're going to address it. Um, I, thi I think that does require the C word. It does need collaboration with all supplying partners to understand, okay, what are your ideas? How do we actually ch uh, you know, address this issue? Um, but it also needs the OEMs to actually be sharing you know, what our vision of that future is. You, you know, you can't do it, but you, you can't, uh, you, you know, develop a plan uh, on, with one side or part of the information. You have to have both sides of the information. And I think that historically that's something which has been lacking from both sides. So it is important that the, the, the two parties come together, but it comes back down to something which has, again, been spoken a lot about in the conference, which is all about trust. And, uh, and, and there has to be that mutual trust between suppliers and OEMs um, you know, to share information, um, to actually share plans, um, uh, plans and, and sometimes sensitive, informa sensitive information as well. Um, but that's the only way I think we can get a more strategic, holistic uh, perspective in terms of what the future is going to look like. Mm. I'll pick up on, and I know Lou has been your, your pet word for, for years, collaboration, and you've been saying, when is it finally going to happen? Uh, one of the presentations, we saw Robert from IBM earlier on talking about blockchain, uh, and again, this sort of trust-based ledger approach to information sharing. Uh, and that, I think, is an opportunity to force that collaboration, which maybe is, is missing at the moment. But uh, certainly some of the, uh, the, the new technologies that are coming uh, going to uh, move us in that direction. Um, I, th I think the, the strategy has to be defined globally, I mean centrally, by the, by the headquarters. I think every brand has to define where we want to go in terms of not only logistics, everything is linked. I mean, we are producing cars and trucks and vans faster and faster and faster. Um, some of the di discussion today were about standardization or personalization. Uh, for example, for our S class, we have 50 or 60 different colors inside of the car, which is for logistics is a complexity, obviously, <laughs> because we have this part, we have to have this part, or we have to have access to the suppliers for those parts. But at the same time, we have to make our supply chain uh, uh, easier and more simple. Yeah. So everything is a balance. Um, probably the biggest challenge I, th I see is that uh, the whole organization is, is going to different speeds. Uh, I mean, we, we are seeing how we are selling cars now. I mean, uh, last week there was a news that we are going to produce electric cars in Tascaloosa in Alabama um, in, in one year and a half, okay? Um, and to be honest, uh, we have to be ready for that. And uh, so let's say production is going at one speed, the speed is, uh, sales is going at another speed, and we as after sales, after market or logistics, we have to get, grab this train and go into the same speed, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, the discussion today, um, for example, presentation of Kuhn and Nagel, quite, quite interesting. Um, I think we have only a couple of airlines that can fly batteries worldwide with a, with, without limitations, let's say like that. If you need to, to transport a 700 kilo, a kilograms of batteries, you have a couple of companies only doing that. Maybe one Russian company is stopping over in Moscow, going somewhere. Um, but we are selling cars already, uh, at least to customers, yeah? Mm -hmm. So we have to be in the same speed, all of us. Um, for me, this is a real, real challenge, and this has to be defined globally, obviously. Yeah? Uh, so again, standardization, personalization is a balance. 
and we have to standardize many of our, many of our processes, not forgetting that the customers, for many of our brands, they love to customize the vehicle. And they love to have a special rims, <laughs> special engines, uh, a special color, everything. Um, only in Daimler we are talking about more than one million PAN numbers now. So we cannot stock one million PAN numbers, that's obvious. We need a warehouse of the size of London, probably. Yeah. <laughs> Again, we, we want this to be a discussion, so uh, we do have mics um, in the room. If anybody would like to pipe in, uh, give a perspective, ask a question, make a comment, um, or complain, particularly complain about Louis, uh, we're very open to it. <laughs> uh, okay, but I'll, oh yeah, we have a question from John right here in the front. Before we maybe pick, a complaint. Is it a complaint? Otherwise, we'll switch <laughs> the microphone off. <laughs> <laughs> All right, John, stop your Jeff go. Um, just thinking about the analogy you're using about the orchestra, maybe mm -hmm. a better way, because obviously you were talking about a conductor, which kind of is somebody leading, mm -hmm. and, I, and I do take the point from a colleague on there that um, you can't expect an OEM to be leading and giving them to the 3PL. However, maybe a better way of looking at it is the customer is the composer, and therefore they are determining what is going to be played, and that it's a string quartet where everybody knows what they've got to play and they all play equal parts per to perfect perfection. Mm. So that might be another way of looking at it. Yeah, no, good, good point. And if I was in the order, in the orchestra, I'd be on the fiddle. <laughs> <laughs> it's another word for a violin. <laughs> I had you as a double bass sort of guy. <laughs> uh, we talked about strategy. Uh, how we think, mindset, and so on, uh, and why, how we need to be innovative. But are we throwing out the challenge uh, too broadly? Because I asked, again, a, a survey amongst European car makers. When I say a survey, I called and wrote to about 10 heads of logistics at European car makers and asked them what they want from their LSPs. And they said, they, they kind of, it was a different conversation. Before it might have been lean, you know, cost effective or cost efficient, fast or something like that. But now they're saying they want them to be smart and innovative. But, that's, but then when I kind of tried to get across to the LSPs, they were saying, yeah, that's fine, but what does that mean? You know, so what, does, what do you want from, their, from your LSPs? Uh, and if it is smart and innovative, what makes a smart and innovative logistics uh, service provider? Well, I think with Kia, well, what we, well, certainly in the UK, well, what we like to do is actually choose, uh, choose a supply partner, uh, and we do call them partners, uh, and based on the tender process and everything else like that, we will typically give a long-term contract. That gives us the opportunity to work with the supplier for a long period of time. And not only that, for them, giving them the ability to invest in you know, capital equipment, tech, new technology, etc. When it comes to innovation, innovation doesn't only have to be based around technology. It, you know, it, it, it is a whole range of items. You know, a different way of working. Uh, you know, how how certainly on the finished vehicle side, how to get. Uh, a car from point A to point B in the easiest way possible, or the, the one which reduces the lead time as much as possible. But again, you know, our philosophy has always been, well, it, as long as we can match the customer's target date, the dealer's promise date to the customer, actually that's what we want. It doesn't really matter about getting the car there in the quickest possible time. It, it matters uh, all about ensuring that the vehicle is there when it's promised to get there. So that's one. Um, on the preparation side, it's all about coming to market with more, uh, more efficient operations, uh, offering our dealers uh, our, and our customers options for customization. Um, so, so it is around that side. Yeah. Okay. I, w I would say, um, we, we, we tend to talk about partnership, but we see that that partnership is n not real, a real partnership with some of the service provider, okay? What, what it really, my opinion is after 
some years in logistics in Daimler, different countries as well. Um, what I really appreciate is proactivity, okay? What I appreciate is, okay, um, we are not going to, let's say, follow your tender uh, word by word. This is what we can offer you to go to a next step to, the, to do the extra mile. Um, sounds easy, in my opinion, but it's not so easy. Or at least my experience is not so easy to find that kind of partnership with, with service provider. And we, we use them, of course, um, in all, the, all over the place. Um, um, but I would really appreciate that someone would come to us and say, okay, to move to the next step, you have to do this, 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 and we can provide this, this, this to you, and put in the tender or take into consideration. Honest opinion, many of them follow the tender uh, strictly without much, um, um, I don't know, um, questions, yeah? So I think that's the future. We are not expert in everything uh, in logistics, obviously. Uh, we need the expertise of the service providers, um, but we need that proactivity. I think that's absolutely right. I think, um, and sometimes it'd be nice to get the contract delivered as well, which would be a, a good starting <laughs> point. But um, uh, what we're looking for in, in terms of uh, really developing good partners is uh, is the proactivity. But it's uh, we we aren't the expert in uh, check logistics or. Uh, um, <coughs> Uh, rail going through uh, Poland, the Russian border. Uh, we need expertise from our logistics providers, and what we want is for ideas. We want people to come back and say, well, um, somebody has changed, so if, if Kia have changed a, a particular route, or if somebody, uh, there's a consolidation of supplier or something, and that's opened up an opportunity. These are the things we want to hear, and we want to hear them quickly, uh, to see if we can actually respond. Uh, and that's the, the sort of partnership that we're, we're looking for. And we, we get, we've got some good, really good suppliers and, and some who come and, and offer these parts, but it's not consistent, I think. I mean, that's where we would really like uh, all of our suppliers to, to uh, help us more. Because as, uh, as we've heard, you guys are the experts in your particular field, we're not. Uh, and we need that, we need that help. But when I talk to the LSPs as well, one of the things they say is if we do come up with a great innovation, a great idea, a great cost saver, they'll come to you, you know, or to a car maker and say we've had a great idea, can really save a fortune, this is what it is, and they say that's really good, we'll put it out in the next tender and see which one of all you guys come back with the best price for that. <laughs> I think they're probably fighting, we're probably fighting that we're going to be charged for it. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, th th there, is, th there is that fear that mm. actually, are we going to risk some untested technology mm. in a or, or already constrained supply chain or a very time critical supply chain? Yeah. And will this be a disruptor? And this is the problem from both sides, isn't it? For a cut, the logistics is so low margin on both sides. For you, your budgets are really tight, and for the, the LSPs, their margins are really tight. So that makes the risk uh, for innovation, disruption, and change that much higher because there's no room for mistakes and errors. So, yeah. so just a thought, really. I'm, I'm just concerned that that would re, uh, reduce uh, innovation and bringing in new ideas. Yeah, I think that's right. I'd like to think we'd be responsible. I think, think we are. I think we have been um, in looking at uh, changes in the logistics routes in, in between tender periods. Mm. Um, and I think the, you mentioned a really good point, which is uh, investment. Uh, and margins are really tight. And it is uh, often hard to, uh, to make a proposal and to justify investment. I, I'd say, certainly from personal experience, uh, in 20 years, I would think that the access to investment now is it's probably harder than it's ever been. Uh, and from a, a logistics supplier point of view, we're, we're very sensitive to that. I think the flip side of it, though, is as we're, we're entering this period of change, which is rapid and accelerating, <laughs> people who are not able to invest uh, are not going to be there. We are not going to survive if we are not investing in somewhere in the future. So I think that's the tension that, that we've got to navigate. But um, no, I understand it's, it's a tough conversation. Fully agree. The, the thing, or the, sorry, the change has started, and the real change has started. We have to be on board, or not on board. I mean, it's, uh, we have to invest. I think we have to invest in a clever way, obviously. Um, but without investment in the next years, um, 
it's going to be quite difficult to uh, fulfill our customers, obviously. Yeah? Yeah. Things are changing so quickly. Yeah. Um, and as I asked before in one of the questions, I think we are, we, our logistics in automotive is still, uh, still a little bit conservative. Okay? We are still building the warehouses in the same way, um, with the same systems, same racks, you know, probably changing something here and there, but nothing dramatically uh, innovative, and we have to change that, obviously. Yeah? And of course, if the market is growing, the solution cannot be to get a bigger warehouse or to get a new land or to build 25,000 square meters more. That cannot be, okay? That was like this in the, in the past and it worked, but it's not going to work anymore. So we have to change what we have in a much more efficient way. And this for me is a big, big, big challenge because probably we don't know yet how to do it <laughs> in a proper way. Huh? Yeah. And electric batteries is a, is, is a it's a good example. We cannot put the batteries where the filters are. I mean, we need the sprinkle, sprinkle systems. We need uh, 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 special, special uh, uh, shelves, you know. So if tomorrow we have to uh, stock 2,000 batteries or 20,000 batteries, we basically have to change the layout of the warehouse. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, and that means money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And it's one of the big challenges, I think, facing this industry and others, but maybe especially logistics when you think about um, disruption from Silicon Valley and startups and, and the types of uh, failure that's necessary to get success, right? I mean, I, we, I give this example before, but we had a CEO from, from Ryder, a big logistics company in North America, talk about going out to Silicon Valley, looking at companies he could maybe invest in. And, the problem is with the venture capitalist model is that um, you invest in 20 companies and 15 of them are expected to fail. Two of them probably break even, two or three break even, and maybe one or two make all the money back. And I don't think that's the model for innovation that works in automotive logistics right now, <laughs> um, if you want to keep your jobs anyway. <laughs> um, so, but, but at the same time, there, there is a, a whole strand of innovation which is coming. From, from outside of the traditional industry. And logistics is in target now. Yeah. It's sexy, again. If you talk to people in Silicon Valley, the Uber has, does, has created this buzz around it. And there's lots of different apps, just matching truck pairings and, and freight networks. I talked to one logistics provider last night. I don't know if he's in the room. I won't say who he is, just in case it's a, not a public number, although I think it is. That, that logistics company is investing $450 million a year just in their IT, just in, just in this, and that's just to keep up. This isn't strictly just automotive. Um, but the, this is a, it's a kind of, you know, from each side. So, I mean, all that just to say, where do you have room in your supply chain to perhaps have a little room for failure to, in, to innovate, to, to, to experiment, to actually look towards new ideas that, that you know, might not pay off in six months or in the next RFQ. Is there a space for it in, in, from, from your point of view? Well, um, <laughs> interesting. Um, it, yeah, I, th I think in terms of investing in solutions, I think, you know, it has to be customer uh, customer driven so you know you know the ability to purchase uh, purchase a vehicle online and get it delivered to the uh, end customer you know to their do to their door it may not be something which will immediately happen but it will happen if it, if it eventually and, and there is this uh, groundswell of uh, consumers who don't want to be going to a dealer. They know exactly what they want and they're happy with the price so they just go through and buy it. So so I think there are a number of uh, OEMs which are already experimenting with this mm. but that does require a new logistics model mm. um, and I think that if we were going to experiment with something it would be that. Um, certainly on the logistics side, and then there's the whole the, the, the whole questions about okay, how do you service those customers? Yeah, you know, so that that potentially opens up another uh, sort of micro industry in terms of you know being able to collect the car, service the car, and return it to the to the customers. So. I think that's a good point because I mean it's it's a high risk industry, isn't it? Yeah. And you can't afford to fail your customers. Yeah. You can't afford to have big bang system changes which could fail and, and, and uh, stop the business. So uh, one of the, the approaches we've, we've been taking that uh, has just been described is, uh, is, is really sort of doing things in parallel. So you, you've got new, new business that, that we're investigating. 
we, we run that in parallel, we develop the systems, processes, the people, uh, and then we can learn from that and then uh, pollinate across to uh, the rest of the mass business. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I think we, we cannot forget that at the end of the day, we, what we have to do, for example, in our case, which is parts logistics, is to deliver parts from here, from us to the customer, with the best quality in the right time. We cannot forget that. It's nice to be innovative, we have to be innovative, but we cannot forget the basics, okay? We cannot go into, I'm a Spanish, a little bit passionate. <laughs> passionate. Uh, we cannot go into NASA presentations, you know, trying to change everything, but the basics are not working, okay? So we cannot forget that we have to deliver every day whatever thousand of parts to the customers in the best way. Apart from that, what you said about the uh, Silicon Valley and so on, what all the brands are doing now is looking quite closely at the startups, what the startups are doing. And all startups are not anymore in Silicon Valley, by the way. They are in other places like Tel Aviv, for example, Israel, thousands of them. Yeah. And BMW, Mercedes, Volkswagen, all of them are looking at the startups and checking which startups could be interesting for us in the future and investing money on them. Um, it's a risky uh, business, obviously, mm -hmm. because a startup is a startup and it's a new idea and it's a new concept. But it's obvious that we don't have all the ideas w at home yeah, to change the world. So um, what we have to do is, again, to look outside what the brilliant minds are doing and invest money on that and keep the basics working. So deliver the parts every day to the customer. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Black and white doesn't work. Yeah? Mm -hmm. okay. Any questions from the audience? Question in the middle there, please. Oh, that was convenient. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's Rob Garrett from IBM. Um, you were talking there about the move towards online sales and how that changes logistics. So I was um, thinking back to the last of the poll questions, which was about the speed with which um, we'd be moving to vehicles having some sort of online you know, online ordering, online connectivity, etc. I, personally, I was really staggered by the low number. Uh, I think it was you know 20-ish percent within 20, 10 years. I mean, I, I for one have you know Mercedes me on my phone. Well, at least one of you will be happy about that. <laughs> so, uh, you know, maybe maybe my understanding of the question was different to other people's, but I wonder perspectives on really how quickly we're going to get to cars ordered online, connected online, maintained online, things like that. Connecting online is, is working already, but it depends in every region. Not all the regions are ready to connect cars online, obviously. We have a smart cities, and these smart cities will work well. And I would say London probably is one of them. Dubai is one of them. Singapore is one of them. China uh, is, or Beijing and Shanghai are one of them. Cairo will never be in the next 20 years one smart city. Um, probably many, many Middle, East, Middle Eastern cities will not be. The infrastructure is not there. So um, I would say, yes, we are working on that strongly. Yeah. But again, we have to differentiate that not all the customers out there will be able to access to this connectivity quickly because not all the cities are ready for that, obviously. Yeah? Um, but it's clear that every, I mean, if you have kids, so when the kid is going into the car, first thing he wants to have is connectivity as well. He, be, he wants to be connected, yeah? So we cannot forget that these kids are the customers in 10 years or in eight years. We cannot forget the car has to be they have to be connected now, yeah? But in my opinion, it depends clearly on the region worldwide, and not all the regions are ready to be connected today. Yeah, yeah I think that's true. And I think there's also a progression of, of um, connectivity or ordering online, isn't there? So uh, one step, for example, is the fact that I can configure my car online, but then that configuration is, is understood by the dealer that I go to, uh, and I can, I can move between the two. Uh, the next may be that I order it online completely, but then is it delivered to a dealer or is it delivered to... So there's, there, are, there are steps that I think we're all finding our way uh, along that, uh, that spectrum. Uh, and I, I, th I agree, I think uh, different regions, different countries will go along that spectrum at different paces. I think uh, it does... It depends on the mode of purchase. You, you know, if, if someone's purchasing a vehicle outright, um, then that's going to be different to someone who's buying a vehicle through PCH, you know, where it is just a function of, I need a car, and it is this much per month. Therefore, I'm more comf comfortable 
to actually go online and order a car and have it delivered. Um, I think from an OEM's perspective, and I, think, I don't know if this is true of Honda and, uh, and Mercedes, but there is a fear of actually these guys, the, the dealer network has spent hundreds of millions or millions and millions of pounds um, and they've invested their life savings or big groups, so they're big PLCs and all of a sudden if we change our focus to say, right, we're going to have pop-up shops in, in Westfield or, you know, bring all our business online, what impact is it going to have on these guys? Because that experiment could quite easily fail. And I think the traditional consumer um, who is, you know, either taking out a loan or, uh, you, you know, taking up uh, or using their hard-earned cash to buy a car, you know, they will still want to do all their research and then go into a dealer, uh, into a showroom, and because it's a lot of money, yeah. so so that transition is going to take a little bit. You know, I think ten years is probably about the right amount of time. But by then, I think the whole business model would have changed anyway because of the advent of autonomous vehicles and everything else around that. But, but that's why I was surprised that I agree with you. I think the. the my expectation is that it would be more than that. Uh, doesn't necessarily mean that all of these cars are being delivered directly to someone's house. I think uh, you know the, there's a lot of mileage to go before we're we're seeing a complete business model change. But I, I think probably 20% is is a bit low. But I think I think we are also assuming that in the next 30 years, all of us we are going to move with the technology in the same way, and this is not the not, it's not the case. I mean, obviously, my dad, who is now 75, he needs to have the car explained. And he got a C class one day for a year. He got it for a year, okay? And he, the car was over engineered for him, you know? So he needs someone to explain the car, look, these are the functions. We are assuming that in 30 years, we are all, all of us, we are going to order the car online, and maybe we are not moving with the technology in the same way. We are also getting old, what, what, what is coming, you know? So we will need someone to explain the car in the future. Probably the dealer network has to be a, a smaller, clear, but we will need someone we need the option to go to a dealer to buy a car as well. So I don't think it's going to be 100% online ordering in 30 years, nothing like this is personal opinion. Yeah. Role of the dealer will change, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Yeah. But it's also a generational thing. So, you know, I'm sure when my kids are old enough to purchase their cars, um, certainly the, the way that they use the internet and they use everything and they think that everything is accessible very, very quickly. So they'll probably their whole purchase psychology will be very, very different to myself or my father's or, 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 or you know, people of my peer group. Sort of, sort of on, on this point, we had a discussion in the US, again, at a conference two weeks ago, and one of it came about increasing the visibility to your end customer, uh, specifically as the end customer, you know, an app, for example, that would show the progress of production or, or even show where it is on the supply chain, kind of Amazon style, regardless of whether even Let's get around how you do it and stuff. Um, but what came out from Finnish vehicle logistics leaders there was that they were kind of scared to do it, actually. And where they have done it to an extent with dealers, they've gotten a lot of phone calls and had to employ more people to deal with those calls. And it was always just a big inconvenience, you know? Um, which this is perhaps a worrying perspective, but, but OK, that's the reality of where they felt right now. Um, where do you sit on this? I mean, do you want to, do you, do you think the end customer should have that, that level of visibility? Do they need that level, that, that, that your car is, 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 is waiting in, in Bremerhaven or wherever in some port um, for a connecting ship or something like that? Or, or, or is it a different level? And, and can, is there value in that visibility for the dealer, for the, for the end customer? I, th I think for, um, in the traditional model where you have a dealer, um, you know, the dealer's job is to build a relationship with the customer, you know, so that they get repeat sales of you know parts, uh, parts, accessories. So wherever you can add value to the end customer, it can only be a good thing. Yeah, yeah. So I think if you have the ability to provide. Uh, diluted information or, or very safe information back to the customer with a margin in terms of when the actual target delivery date for delivery is, that's going to be beneficial, I think, to the customer because they're, they're seeing that actually I've spent X number of thousand pounds in purchasing this car 
and I want to know where it is. It's a big, big deal. But if you're dealing with cars day in day out, it gets quite boring. Uh, but you, you have to remember about the individual purchasing car. It may be the first new car that they've ever purchased. So they are genuinely excited. And, you know, the dealer's uh, job is to ma maintain that excitement, maintain that expectation. But if they can provide sanitised information where there is a comfortable margin uh, of when they're going to be getting that car, I think that is valuable. That does provide value to the deal. But that information has to be right and that delivery date has to be right because you can have all the technology in the world and if if that date isn't hit um, the whole thing goes to pop yeah i think that that's true and, and, and alan was talking about it earlier on wasn't he about um, reliability being fundamentally important and, and the reason we're scared i think maybe of that information being available is actually how reliable is it to, to the end customer and um, there's a risk that we don't hit it and, and therefore that would cause further problems but um, if, we're, if we're serious about reducing the complexity of our supply chains, reducing lead time, taking lead time out as much as possible, uh, using processes, new processes, new technology, whatever that is, uh, then we can at least have a little bit more confidence that we're going to ach achieve that arrival date. And then maybe it's a bit less sensitive releasing that to the customer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fully agree. I mean, um, we have to provide what the customer wants, yeah? Um, if the customer wants to know where the car is, and he's in Bremenhaven waiting to be <laughs> delivered to the UK. Maybe he's having dinner with friends and take the phone and say, look, my car is going to be shipped in two days, you know, so we'll have it here next week. That's really expectations. You know, this is what the customer wants at that time. We have to try to provide it. I think what you said as well is obvious. I mean, the, 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 the delivery date or the promised delivery day has to be fulfilled, obviously. Mm -hmm. You know, if we said we're going to deliver this car in a week, in a week you will have it, you have to have it in a week. That's clear. And this is one of the things that for me is more difficult to achieve, not only because of the systems, it's because you cannot control the whole chain at the end of the day. Yeah? Mm. You can have uh, situations in the port, you can have strikes, you can have suppliers into the bankruptcy, things like that. So to promise, to be able to promise a time of arrival in cars or parts or something is, is extremely difficult today. Yeah. Yeah. But I think the expectation is absolutely correct. I can go online yep. and order a pizza and it can tell me what stage of preparation and delivery and, and arrival is going to be. And if I can do that with a pizza, I certainly know my kids will be expecting that from a, a major car. purchase yep. like a car. Yeah. But the thing is, and I, we can't expect three car makers on a panel uh, to say that, you know, too much about the dealers, to be fair. Uh, but I think uh, it has to change. I think even the, you know, because the next generation, you know, people at your age in 10 years' time, maybe, you know, you, you still will need the dealer. But in general, the next generation of people, I mean, this to me is complicated trying to use it. They don't even barely send you instructions. And the people, who, the next generation of buyers, my age and, and younger, <laughs> are, will be used to this kind of experience. And we will need to make the promises and, and stick to them. Because the promises are still made. You might not be able to see it online and track it, and track it, but the dealer has usually made a promise, and there's been you know three or four people recently either working directly with us or related in some kind of way have bought brand new cars and had terrible experiences, uh, and they were promise dates that weren't stuck to. You know, one was you know a, a kind of a, a vacation a holiday was ruined because the date wasn't stuck to. And you even get the other side of that. There was one who got ordered a car, uh, a good car. It wasn't ready, so the car maker gave them an even better car, a much better car for two weeks until the car came. But then what happens is when the car comes, you're actually disappointed. <laughs> you know, you were really looking to get in that car, but when for two weeks you've actually been driving a much better one, the same brand and a better one, you're actually disappointed. So we have to. <laughs> We have to make a difference. You know, I'm scared, or scared, well, whatever, that's not the right word. But the dealers, unless they change, will be the black cab drivers. And the next, the guys who will be selling and growing will be the Ubers. But I think from, again, that just sort of reinforces the importance of the dealer. If, if you can't get the car there when you want to or you've got a problem, who do you go to? Do you go back to the manufacturer, OEM? You know, that causes us 
a, a huge problem because you know most OEMs are mm. fairly lean organisations, mm. and mm. You, you know, or does that fall back onto the, the supplying partners to go and collect the car and take <laughs> it back to the prep centre and get it yeah. repaired? So I think you, you're right. The, mm. the, there is a role for the network, mm -hmm. but it's going to be a very different one. Uh, but they have to, be, that, that, you know, again, from our, my perspective, from other OEMs' perspective, they have to, they have still got a vital role until we know what that new model looks like. Yeah. Um, I think we need the dealers. We need them. Probably we need the very professional ones. Is what I said in the beginning. We need a different mindset. In the dealership, we need ownership. Um, I worked in a dealer three years. I can tell you they were the most intense years in my life. <laughs> no joke. The best MBA I could do in my life. <laughs> Forget all these business <laughs> London things, you know. <laughs> it was a real MBA for three years, you know. Having the customer in front of you, okay, why my car is not ready? Mm. Why the, 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 the invoice is so expensive? Why the part is not there? Mm. This is really challenging. But you need ownership. You need to understand why the customer is okay. and then. Mm. Then I also spent five years in Dubai. Customer in Dubai is <laughs> what you said. I mean, in the dealers in Dubai, they have a few S-Class mm. as a courtesy car, a couple of SLS, <laughs> okay, which is a 200,000 <laughs> pounds car, SLS courtesy car, because the customer there are driving so, such cars, you know? Yeah. So we need the dealers because I don't think in the OEMs we have the knowledge to understand the customer so deeply, mm -hmm. honestly speaking. But you're right, we need a very professional dealer network that be able to react to the future, to react what is what is happening now. Mm -hmm. And the variety of customers we have today is, is huge, yeah. it's huge. It's probably not like 30 years back. We have now all the generations, all the ages, all the kind of models and model range, so it's very complex. Mm -hmm. We had a question up here, so we can get it. And then don't don't forget, please, to get involved in my. Oh, great, we had a, we have another one. We'll go move from the back after it, that. It's not a John Stocker, Jeffco. It, it's not a question so much as I was interested in what you're saying about what the customer needs and how the dealer could or couldn't provide it. And there were questions raised about. Um, delivering uh, vehicles on car transporters to private houses, clearly that's not going to happen, etc. However, this already happens, gentlemen. This already happens today. All the things you asked about happen. We do it for, de for demonstrative fleets, for you guys on behalf of OEMs. We manage the contact with the customers. They go online, they book a delivery date at, and a time. En route, the vehicle is cleaned if it's a, if it's a bad day. It is... Um, the, the customer is text on the way by the driver, pulls over safe, to give them an exact delivery time. When the vehicle gets there, all the controls are explained. They've been given a full handover. This already happens. It's not something that's a long way in the future. It's just happening today on demonstrator fleets. Why not extend that principle mm. to the finished vehicle? If you mm. prepare those vehicles in PDI, a port of entry, or a manufacturer compound, then you don't have to send the transport. So what you have to use is hubs that move the vehicle to a closer delivery point, and then the final mile is with a chauffeur, with a handover agent, etc. So this isn't rocket science. It's not something that's a long way in the future. And as I said, on behalf of the OEMs, we already do this today. All of the things that you spoke about. So I just make that point. Yeah. Hey, thank you. Thank you. But I think the key thing there is the interaction between the customer. And, uh, and the dealer, it, because it, typically it's the dealer who has sold the car to no, the customer. No, in, no, the customers we work for, it's our agents that actually communicate with the customers. They book directly through us and we then give the information back to the OEM. But it's our, it's our agents that are booking the delivery slot. It's our agents that are communicating with the customer. It's our agents that if the customer wants to change the delivery or they're not going to be in or you know they want it to be into the office instead of the home, we take all of that, yeah. we deal with it. So, as I say, the model, everything that you spoke about in that model actually exists today. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's, yeah, it's a question of how you roll that out. Uh, exactly, I think you're right, John. I think the, um, the difficulty from speaking uh, from a personal point of view, I think, is probably how to engineer that into the, the whole ordering process. And I think that's where we've got huge gaps at the moment. We couldn't do that overnight, uh, and it would probably take many years to be able to do it. So uh, almost as we said before, in, in terms of running new operations in parallel, this is a good example. 
but how to mi migrate that into the, the rest of the order process, I think that's, that's quite complex for us. We did have another question over there. I wanted to move to a different side of the room. I'll come back, but there was a question on this side. Mm. And, uh, thanks. Actually, there was a couple of points. Christopher Campbell from VNet. Um, I think one, one of the questions, one, one of the points you raised is about the dealers. And uh, you, you say it's inevitable that the dealer networks are going to be reduced. And that's going to put pressure on your lean organizations. I think in other industries, you're looking at uh, where, where similar things are happening. You do, it's, it's incumbent upon you to increase your customer care service teams. And I think that, that that's inevitable that, um, that people will be contacting you, the manufacturer, for, for more information. And, and the other point is when, when I'm with friends and I finally confess that I work in automotive logistics, <laughs> um, people get, actually, funny enough, get quite interested. And they say, well, I ordered a car and I was able to follow it on an app. And then it arrived in Perth. It took three weeks to get from Perth to Hill, but at least I knew it was going to come. So these apps do exist, and people do get extremely excited, as you were saying about it, uh, arriving at a, talking at a dinner party, look, here's my car. It's actually in the middle of the North Sea somewhere, <laughs> <laughs> uh, going around the oil rigs. But it's, uh, the people are really, really happy to have these apps, and I think it should be actively pursued. Okay. Yeah. Alistair Newton, Automotive Logistics. <laughs> This is probably slightly left the field, but um, looking into the future, um, I mean, I still get excited about going out and choosing a car, going down to the dealership, haggling at the end of the month, because I know you guys have got to hit your figures. Um, but then I get very upset if, if my car, I'm told on the Friday afternoon, I'm sorry, Mr. Newton, but you can't come and pick up your car, because uh, it is slightly delayed. But we all still, I still get excited about the new reg and what's coming out on the road, etc. And we have these two peaks, which are great for the consumer, um, but from a logistics perspective, it, it causes congestion. There. Everybody panics about, can we get enough cars out of the port and in the port and move them around? It, do we think that um, in the over, well, within the next decade, where there's going to be a scenario where we're not going to have um, a buying pattern where we get the peaks in the, in, specifically in the UK? And, and that actually, the way uh, we are as a consumer now, we expect everything the next day. Is it, are we going to get to a point specifically within the UK market where we won't have these um, peaks, these two major purchasing dates where we, we used to get excited? And still do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I, an interesting question. I suspect you're probably right thinking about it. Uh, I think the, um, the change in buyer behaviour that we're talking, we'll talk about, I think probably will lead to a smoothing of those, those peaks. I think the... Um, uh, the days, the sort of 70s, 80s, 90s, where there's sort of such excitement about the new reg plate and, and having the new car on, on the drive. Uh, maybe that's going to be removed a little bit. I, I guess you're probably right, but uh, not in the short term, I suspect. No, totally agree. D I totally agree with that. I, th I think as, uh, as consumer behaviour changes, the buying models change and the funding options change and technology changes, I think that will eventually change. But I think we're yeah. stuck with two peaks for a while, much to the happiness of everyone in the automotive yeah, industry. I really Which hope it does, does change, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you all agree. Yeah. Uh, but because it, it ha does have its fair share of challenges. Yeah. And, you know, obviously the head office head offices know we've got two peaks, so they love stuff, stuffing us full of stock. <laughs> so, um, yeah. I'm talking, talking about the new generations, that they want to have really mobility. Mm -hmm. Probably they want to have a car as well. I mean, many of them will have the passion for cars as I had when I was a kid, uh, still have, of course, but they want to have mobility. I don't think they will be quite interested to have a six, seven, or a seven, eight, or mm -hmm. in the in the registration number. So I think it's going to be, yeah, it's going to smooth in the in the next years. I think so. Yeah. Any other other questions? I, I kind of repeat my humble kind of request in the beginning that we hear from some of the professional women in logistics we have here. Although that's not going to be that's not the first time I've I've been rejected by by women, and I doubt the last. So <laughs> if. Uh, <laughs> Oh, there's a lovely woman with a beard there, I think, who's put her hand up. <laughs> yeah, just as a comment, uh, there's a little bit of a disconnect in my mind behind uh, being a tier one manufacturer that has to organize a supply chain on a global basis and then pulling all of those parts together in an individual personalized sequence at a 60 second tack time for a variety of OEMs why, if we have to promise what we're delivering, 
to a 60 seconds tax time, <laughs> why there is a certain amount of reticence within the OEMs to be able to promise a particular car on a certain day. If we can do it within 60 seconds, why can you not do that within a day? It's a great point. Can you just say your name without, and company too, by the way? Appearing to be bitter, <laughs> I'm sure that you would understand where I'm coming from. That, so. that, that bitterness isn't coming across at all, don't worry. It's, it's fine. <laughs> Um, I completely agree, and I think um, if I, if I, I mean, I'm not on the inbound parts side, but I have a lot of sympathy for the guys that are. It's, it's a uh, level of intensity beyond where I think the Finnish car side is, uh, and I don't understand why. And I don't understand why we uh, have different expectations of of Finnish car. Now we we've just been through this this tender round, and we're looking at. Um, uh, targeting our, our suppliers on delivering to within a three-day window. Uh, and you wouldn't believe the difficulty we have just to, to focus on that narrow window. Uh, and uh, it's, it's just a disconnect, isn't it? Because I mean, the, the technology is there, the, the capability is there in, in the industry, in this room, we, I'm sure we could organize it. But um, in, in terms of finished car logistics, we're not joined up enough to deliver that. Uh, and, and actually the uh, continuous improvement mentality across the supply chain I think doesn't exist uh, and, and we're not seeing enough of that rigorous focus on reducing lead time, guaranteeing reliability <coughs> and arrival times uh, that, that you take for granted in uh, inbound parts logistics and I think that is the next step, I think it has to be. Well, exactly. I mean, I'm speaking as the managing director of a company called SMR, so we make all the door mirrors uh, for five major OEMs, uh, 17,000 mirrors a day that we make to just in time, and every single one of them is on time. And um, hence, if I can do 17,000 door mirrors a day on time to a 60 second tact on average, then that's why, that's why I raised the point. It's interesting to hear um, how we've put all that effort into all of that accuracy at our end for it to be seemingly a problem at the other end. I think, I think distance, of, uh, you know, an obvious uh, answer is distance is one of the issues. If we're delivering a car to Romania or Czechoslovakia or, or somewhere, then uh, clearly there's a lot of stages in the supply chain that, that need to be coordinated and, and can obviously extend lead time. And, and therefore everybody tends to build in a bit of a buffer and then the reliability of the final arrival date is, is reduced. So and until we can uh, rigorously look at that supply chain in a way that is completely reliable, then I think we're, we're, we're not going to be matching the inbound parts uh, performance. To be fair, they're pretty accurate within, you know, five, six days, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, in, in, in new vehicles, you, you are fully right. Uh, if we talk about parts, yeah. if we talk about thousands of suppliers worldwide, I mean, last week, there was two weeks ago, a earthquake in Mexico, there are suppliers over there that probably they have to rebuild factories or you have um, floods in Chennai in India every year, by the way, mm. or you have, I don't know, things like that. It's extremely difficult. It's not impossible, to be honest. At least our company wants to go there. It wants to go to this 99% of full availability in parts, which is extremely difficult because we're talking about thousands of suppliers yeah, and thousands of part numbers. So. Um, yeah, I would say this is a big challenge in the future, how to be able to, not only in new vehicles, also in parts, to be able to promise a time of arrival. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's, that's the big, big challenge in the future. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Especially when, not to mention any OEMs in particular, but when... So do we need the microphone? I don't know if you can hear it around the room. Yeah, it's just so better for the... For the yeah, thank you. Okay. Yeah, just to add to that, when the financial pressure um, as one particular OEM has said, if you don't have your parts in time to us, we will charge you £32,000 per minute. <laughs> so, again, <laughs> no bitterness. But uh, yeah. it just adds to the disconnect of what's expected at the supply end that isn't reflected at the outbound end. Yeah. This is, sorry, this is what I said more or less. How to balance the personalization of new vehicles that everybody wants to have something different in the car, mm -hmm. especially in premium brands, mm -hmm. with the simplicity of parts numbers. You know, how to, how to be able to create beautiful cars, trucks, or vans for customers that they want to have a special color inside, whatever, 
with less part, num part numbers. Mm -hmm. this, is the, this is the key, how to get that. This is with the financial impact that you say, obviously, yeah? At the end of the day, it's a very complex puzzle that we have to, we have to build, yeah? yeah. Great. I, I don't work on the, uh, on the production side, but yet, you know, trying to defend OEMs, if you've got a factory, the factory is targeted with making X number of cars per hour, per, per day, et cetera. And the only justification I can give to that is actually if those parts don't turn up, the factory can't produce a finished vehicle, which then impacts all along the way the finished supply chain. So, you know, just in the defense of OEMs, mm. I think that would be my only justification. And, and, you know, because it's a process, the components that you're making are a vital part of that process. And if they don't turn up, then the whole process falls down. And also to, to kind of make the point that although the the time critical aspect of plants is, is, is amazing. If you tell a carrier that we're going to build X number of cars to this market in five days and say, guaranteed, I promise it's going to be there, bring up your trucks, no carrier is going to believe it because <laughs> plants tend not to actually be able to deliver exactly the car and one that went constantly resequencing, constantly having to change to account for the variability within those plants, which has actually an impact on the outbound chain. You know, so you, you kind of need the plant to give you the exact car. Uh, I mean, some cars, car makers are getting better at this, and this is a big project, at quite a few. But I think uh, yeah, it's a different target to say, okay, we got the car out, as opposed to say we got that car specifically that we said we were going to do. And that doesn't happen as much as, as uh, yeah, I think. But perhaps the other answer is, is, the, is the financial side. If every customer got 32,000 pounds a day, a week, for every car that was late, you know, we'll see if the vehicle logistics <laughs> became a little bit better. But. Yeah, no, I'm not bitter really, I just wanted to be provocative really. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just raise the point to you guys as OEMs for yeah. the pressure that we're mm. under. Um, yeah. It's tier one suppliers into yeah. you. Yeah, fortunately none of us are manufacturing, so... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good answer. Yeah. Yeah. I, I suppose, just from a different angle, I suppose there is a difference between, you know, the SLAs that you've got and the penalty clause that you've got versus moving a finished vehicle uh, through a process. Because obviously, you know, it is a physical process of getting a finished vehicle through a PDI centre and then onto the back of a truck, and then to the dealer or to the final end customer. You know, capacity in ports is finite. We know that. Uh, we know that, you know, uh, transportation resource is finite. There's only so much transportation resource in the UK, for example. And, you know, you, we've got X number of manufacturers, OEMs around the country, which are vying for that capacity. So, uh, uh, and, and, and that is, uh, is a problem. That is true, and if you've ever worked with a national sales company and seen the accuracy of their forecasts, then maybe you'd understand <laughs> a little bit about yeah. you know, why it's, it's quite tricky. Any more questions from the room? We've got a question from the app here, and it's kind of two questions, and both of them, although he's asked uh, to compare one to the other, he's actually asking about which is a greater challenge uh, for you at the moment, Ele uh, electric vehicle logistics or Brexit? Well, I think I'll, I'll kind of split them into two, because uh, although we kind of keep alluding to the B word, um, you know, so I'll ask firstly on Brexit, what are you actually doing uh, to plan for Brexit? <laughs> we, we, we are working in, the, in all the divisions in the company mm -hmm. um, to, to get a, a a real picture, let's say like that, yeah? Mm -hmm. Of course, Brexit is, is a very tricky thing because <laughs> as you said, nobody knows what's <laughs> going on. Um, I'm quite new in the UK, a few months only, but it was a surprise for me that nobody really knows what is going mm -hmm. on, yeah? Uh, by the way, I'm Spanish, questions about Catalonia during the dinner. Yeah? <laughs> no I, will re I will reply, give you my, <laughs> my private um, personal opinion. Um, Brexit, is going to change the picture, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, I cannot say that we are not uh, worried about it or concerned about it. Um, obviously, we are not doing some things that we could do mm -hmm. if Brexit is not there, you know? Mm -hmm. So we are waiting and, see, and seeing what is going on. Uh, of course, we are moving in a different direction, probably. Um, but yeah, we are not doing everything we would like to do because of Brexit, yeah, clear. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I, I, there is a lot of work going on. It was, it was quite interesting to hear um, the mini presentation yesterday, and they're talking they've had uh, um, uh, people responsible for uh, making the negotiations. They've come visited the plant. Uh, we've done the same, and uh, I'm sure other manufacturers yeah. are also doing the same. Uh, and so that discussion with government and that lobbying of government is is happening quite intensively. I think that's that's very positive. I think the other thing, uh, practically, is uh, as as you say, within individual departments, we're we're looking to contingency plan and, and uh, maybe talking with ports or talking with customs authorities. What practically should we be doing to uh, to second guess what the outcome is? So. The stuff going on is just not very visible, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And, and the same from a key perspective mm. as well. But you know, for an industry as a the Brexit will, in my my opinion, not a, a key opinion. You know, but our industry employs circa what m million people in the UK, yeah, maybe more with associated companies. Um, you know, the, the the parts are shipped from every corner of the world to make a fully assembled vehicle. Um, and uh, there has to be some logical, um, you know, solution to this because the impact, not only to the end customer but to the manufacturers, but, um, to head offices around the world, is going to be massive. Um, you know, and end consumers will be paying significantly more for their vehicles than what they were intending to. So I think that there will be some sense in the, in the final solution, I hope. A friend of mine works in the, in the city, and yesterday he was uh, hosting some people from the Japanese embassy and <coughs> asking me, how do I say, we don't know in Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure all the answers came out of the party conference. And in fact, I think the coach outside that will take us to the gala dinner, it's a bit weird, it has this 350 million number scratched out on it. <laughs> yeah, <so. laughs> and, and the second part to the question was about electric vehicles. So how is that? If, I mean, you've, you've touched about the, the battery. How, you know, how are you guys, you know, planning, looking at, uh, you probably already have plans for electric vehicles in some ways. Yeah, obviously. I mean, it's not, a, it's not a marketing idea anymore, like yeah. probably in the past. Mm -hmm. um, as I said, last week there was a piece of news in the, in the newspaper everywhere. We are going to produce cars in Tuscaloosa now, mm. uh, in Alabama. So yeah, <laughs> we are into electric vehicles. Um, probably the, the question for me is, are we ready in the UK to provide such energy? I think this discussion happened during the day. I mean, do we have enough uh, energy source in the country? to provide the energy we need, yeah? Mm -hmm. um, do we have the infrastructure to, to charge the vehicles? Because obviously, if you have a electric vehicles in 10 years and you are stopping to take a coffee, to have a coffee, you want to have it plugged and maybe get 70% of the battery in 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's obvious, you cannot wait two hours until, mm -hmm. until the car is charged, yeah? So are we ready as country for that? I mean, do we have the energy, the source of energy to provide this, yeah. for me, is the, is the main question. Yeah, and to be honest, I don't have the answer. Um, but yeah, like what I can say is electric is, is coming. Yeah, obviously, and especially in Europe, it will be a big hit. In different regions in the world, will be probably in different way. But here, obviously, will be one of the main drivers in the future. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, I would say, are we ready? No, um, uh, you know, simply if uh, <laughs> and for very simple reasons. I mean, we we will be launching an electric car in Europe in in less than two years, uh, but I don't know what the specifications of that are. I don't know what the charging uh, requirements are going to be. I don't know uh, as it passes through the logistics chain, uh, how many times does it need to be recharged? To what level? What are the the fitment points going to be? The charging stations. So I, I can't share that. I can't um, uh, pass that information down to our suppliers. Mm -hmm. uh, and until I can get that information, then obviously it's going gonna, it's gonna to be difficult to be ready. There's been, uh, certainly from our side, we, we've had an electric vehicle for quite some time and a range of uh, hybrid, uh, hybrid electric vehicles. But I'd agree with both my colleagues. Uh, actually, you know, the, the infrastructure isn't available in the UK. We, we have the necessary infrastructure at our port of entry, um, uh, giving us the ability to charge our stock vehicles. But as soon as they go out to the network, you know, customers are either dependent on charging at home or, or at electrical charging stations. Mm -hmm. um, and there's still this element of 
range a anxiety, mm. but I think that is slowly dissipating wi within consumers. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's all kinds of models. I think Nissan made an announcement today about something they're rolling out in Denmark where they're actually going to give the consumer the option to sell power back from the car onto the grid, especially if they're willing to charge at off-peak periods. It's not a solution that's going to work for everyone, but I think you're going to see this, this market evolve in so many ways that, uh, that will be very different to what we see today. We've got a similar trial working in, in France at the yeah. moment again with um, uh, selling electricity back to the, yeah. to the grid and smart recharging. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, it's a lot to do before it's, uh, it's complete. Any more questions from the from the audience? <coughs> we've had a question on the app, but I'm not sure if we've already covered it. It's from Ford. The question is, what does the panel think about OEMs opening up showrooms in shopping centres? Mm. Uh, do you think they will replace the, the dealerships? <coughs> so I don't know if we've kind of covered that or if you've got anything to add to that, really. So. I think we have probably uh, covered it, but uh, I think Omnichannel is, is coming. Mm -hmm. I think it doesn't, certainly in the short term, it doesn't uh, replace dealerships at all. Uh, it's um, over time, I think we'll see that the role of the dealerships changing for sure, mm -hmm. but the number of channels which will, uh, our customers will be able to purchase a car mm -hmm. is going to increase yeah. substantially, and that may be one of the pop up mm -hmm. shops or, or that sort of uh, way of selling, maybe a route to market. I think it's happening in some places. I mean, in China, you have already that. Um, also, as far as I, I saw, Tesla is doing that in many places, opening in malls or shopping centers. So it depends. In some places, it's already happening. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah. it's, it's all about brand visibility. And uh, mm -hmm. at the moment, I think the, over the past five years, we have seen brands do that. But it's all about getting the brand noticed by a wider cross-section of, of, of the, the 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 buying public, rather than a pure selling channel, but I think that will change over time. Mm. Yeah. I'm just hoping the the shopping mall is in Bista where I'll get good discounts and things <laughs> like that. So. so I think uh, I think that can kind of wrap up the final panel. So firstly, I'd just like to thank the the final panel. I think, I think it was a good, honest discussion. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed the, the one and a half days so far, the, bid, the, the Bini, uh, <laughs> which is now going to be called. No, the BMW Mini Plant Tour uh, yesterday, uh, the cocktail reception last night, uh, hosted by ABP. Uh, the conference today, we've had, I think, all, it's not for me to say, I guess it's for you guys to say, but I think we had uh, good panels throughout the day from, from session one to, to four, sharing different ideas. We've tried to be forward-looking as much as we can uh, because, uh, firstly, you can, you can only moan about the, the current issues and yesterday's issues mm -hmm. so much. And secondly, as we've discussed, we have to look forward. It's no longer a choice. It's a necessity. You know, it's kind of look forward or, or get out, I think, is pretty well what we've got to do. Um, I'd like to thank our sponsors, our gold sponsors, ABP, Evolution Type Crit Time Critical, GBA, Kuna and Nagel, and Priority Freight, our global sponsors, Changju Logistics, CDC, and Jeffco, and our silver sponsors, In4GT Nexus, Macro Plastics, Proact, Royale International, VNet, and XPO. Thank you for your support. Um, we hope we'll see you somewhere around the world. We'll, we'll be back next year uh, when we'll be absolutely certain about Brexit. We'll be absolutely sure that we still don't know what's going on, no <laughs> doubt. Um, so uh, we hope we'll see you back in, in the UK uh, this time of the year. Um, but otherwise, uh, if we're not going to see you there, our next upcoming conferences are Automotive Logistics India in, in Chennai, Automotive Logistics South America also in November in Sao Paulo, uh, January's Automotive Logistics Mexico, uh, which is in Mexico. Um, then May, March is Automotive Logistics, is a finished vehicle logistics conference in California. Why would you want to come to California when you can have a similar conference in the UK? I've got no idea. Uh, April is China, Automotive Logistics China in Chengdu. So even if you're not interested in the conference, that's where the pandas are. Uh, May is Automotive Logistics Supply Chain. Uh, in Atlanta. June is Automotive Logistics Europe. 
uh, which is likely to be in Bonn next year. And we've actually got some special new things that we've got planned for Automotive Logistics Europe next year. Uh, we're really going to be shaking up what we do at the conference the, uh, in 2018. Um, Etc. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, as they say, then we have the you know the global conference uh, in Detroit uh, and so on. So we've got a you know come and see us around the world. If you really want to understand what's happening globally, you can watch us live on the live streams. Pretty well every conference has them. If not, at the very least, we record them so you can watch them after. But let's face it, the, the best reason for coming to our conferences is to meet everybody face to face, to network, to share, to hear my jokes live <laughs> and not just on a recording. So, yeah, I can see that was popular. Um, but uh, I hope you've had a, a, good, uh, a good one and a half days. And I think hopefully we're going to fi finish it off, off uh, with a bang. Hopefully not from a wand that's killing us all or anything like that. Uh, but I hope you can all join us at the Harry Potter experience uh, hosted by Kuda and Nagel. It's really going to be a great fun evening. Uh, the coaches are actually outside now, but they won't be leaving uh, for about another 15, 20 minutes. So if you want to just refresh, powder your nose, which actually takes me 15 or 20 minutes, um, then uh, we look forward to seeing you later. For those who can't join us, we hope you've had a great day. Uh, but otherwise, we'll see you later. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.